Hello, it's Scott Manley here with Interstellar Quest episode 11 and this is a first another experimental mission testing new technologies. We have a three-man crew of Sidzi, Dildred and Sherhat Kerman and they are going to space hopefully for longer than anybody else has before. We have the 2.5 meter rocket technology, We've, we're building a rocket with that. However, we don't have access. Oh, wait a second, just trying to straighten this thing out a little. Uh, the 2.5 meter technology, rocket technology, is pretty good, but we don't have large engines. So, you see, I've created this first stage by essentially clustering together a bunch of 1.25 meter stages. And this may look a little janky to you, but there is a precedent for it. The Saturn 1B rocket pretty much used the same model for its first stage. And okay, we're starting to wobble a little more. Come back. Saturn 1B is the less famous Saturn rocket. Everybody knows the Saturn V, which launched the Apollo program to the moon. But the first Apollo flight in space, Apollo 7, or the first manned Apollo flight, was flown on a Saturn 1. And its first stage was essentially made of uh, fuel tanks from. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Come back. No, no. I think. I, I think I probably need some struts on this. That's maybe what's going on here. Because this thing does seem to want to get some random phantom torques. Now it's going to come back go the other way. Although I, I think I've got far enough out of the atmosphere that we have control of this. Okay, what was I saying? Yeah, the Saturn 1B first stage, it was made of essentially eight redstone rocket tanks and a Jupiter rocket tank with a a whole cluster of smaller engines below it. Unlike, you know, the first stage of the Saturn V, which had these five massive engines and, you know, giant tanks that were specifically set up. The first stage of the Saturn v, uh, 1 uh, would launch essentially the same upper stages as the, the Saturn V, so it was actually useful for testing the equipment, which is why launching, you know, Saturn 1 made a lot of sense, or Saturn, the Apollo 7. Oh, crap. Crap, crap, crap. Um... Yeah, I should have probably had some fuel lines or something going on. That middle engine provided uh, thrust vectoring. Okay, now we're set. Good thing with that never caused any major disasters there. Okay, now we're actually on to these uh, new parts. We have the, the Poodle engine here, uh, generating a whole 250 kilonewtons of thrust, which should get us into orbit. Although my time to apoapse is decreasing, which is... Never a good sign. And, uh, yeah, well, there's a few other things we'll talk about. Yeah, Saturn 1B was, as I said, it's kind of the forgotten rocket, but it was used for, uh, you know, early Apollo testing. It was used for Apollo Soyuz, and it was used for Skylab. It didn't launch Skylab, but it launched uh, the, you know, crew to and from Skylab. Uh, and, yeah, the first stage was essentially made of redstone rockets and... Uh, a Jupiter rocket fuel tank. I say fuel tank. The engines were slightly different and they were set up differently. And not all of those engines were, had thrust vectoring enabled. But if you remember, the Redstone rocket was essentially the same rocket that was used for the first suborbital flights, right? So th if you think about it, you know, NASA essentially found some old rockets from the Mercury program, strapped them together, and that was their first stage for the Saturn 1B. And of course, that is a gross simplification and exaggeration but it's an image that you will get in your head and of course you can go off and read wikipedia and find out the real truth behind what was going on here yeah i mean the upper stages matched up it had a, an ibm uh computer as well that to control its stage and uh, i don't know exactly how long one of the things i do remember was that it's essentially since it matched a lot of the saturn 5 stuff that you ended up using the same launch pad but because it was so much shorter, they essentially made what they called a milk stool. It was like a little stool they sat the rocket on to lift it up because it was so much shorter. And that meant that the crew access happened at the same altitude. Okay, we're definitely getting towards altitude. Now, uh, I want to ditch this before I go into orbit. I want this bottom stage to fall back to Earth or back to the planet Kerbin and the rest will go into orbit. Um... What we have is is a little fairing in the middle here, and you'll see that when it comes out. I 
we're, what we're doing essentially is we're trying to launch a space station. This is going to be the first Kerbal space station. The core is going to be a habitation module with some, you know, power, a lot of life support. You see, life support is like 647 days. We have three crew, uh, so that should hopefully last them a couple of hundred days each. And really what we're doing is we're... We're testing the the long you know long duration space flight with these guys. Now we have a couple of weeks till the Moho uh, window. I do not think we're going to be sending crew to Moho. That seems like a bad idea. We'll then have a dual window. I think that I'm not quite up for dual missions just yet. Separation is good. Engine is fire ready. Let's deploy the solar panels. Notice how everything fitted nicely inside that fairing. That was the real challenge, was to actually find stuff that would neatly fit inside that fairing and still look at least somewhat like a space station. So we have a little engine here. We don't need to do too much. We'll just burn it to get away. And then once we get over there, we can circularize our orbit. 130 30 kilometer orbit, that's, that's good enough for me. There we go. Excellent. Just make some adjustments here. Just want to get it relatively circular. And now, of course, the rest will fall back to the planet Kerbin. We're not interested in, in tracking them. But I, I will switch to it. You don't have to watch these things falling back. I mean, you're not that interested in the rigors of re-entry, are you? No, I'm going to end up watching this and doing all the science spam for you. Speaking of science spam, there really isn't much in the way of instrumentation on this because, to be honest, there's not much science that we don't already have in low Kerbin orbit. And just get this thing set up regardless. Um, oh, waste heat. Oh, wow. So waste heat is going up at uh, 0, 0.0. That, ma that means in two days I should exceed my waste heat limits and then I'll be in trouble. But wait, do I do have... I do have those little ones there. <sighs> hmm. I might pull in one of these solar panels. I did not fit a radiator in this because I didn't have one that would fit inside the fairing but I've also just downloaded the the new Kerbal Interstellar pack like version, version 0.8 which includes new, smaller, tinier, more easier to hide radiator systems and just yeah I guess like a hundred meters per second and that'll put it into orbit which is good we have RCS on the front there, you see. The RCS is mostly intended to follow the um, the command module. There's not no RCS on the station itself. The station is essentially just a habitation module with some solar panels, a little some uh, places to dock, uh, solar you know batteries, and uh, communications. That's really it. It's not much, not much here. There, I guess I do have the science stuff, but I'm not going to be able to do much. Aha, now watch this. Decouple. And look at that beautifully arranged set of batteries there, huh? See? Hidden away inside the fairing. That's what we're doing here. So I'm not going to detach the rest of this. You see how there's a gap in there that I exploited? I'm not going to detach that until I uh, start uh, heading back to the atmosphere. Right now, we... Uh, we want to keep that on there. I know it's extra mass, but I want to make sure that all my material goes back and doesn't end up floating through space and one day perhaps causing a problem with the Kessler syndrome. Kessler syndrome, it's our favorite syndrome in deep space, unless we actually work there. No, but it's the Goebbels' favorite. Uh, Kessler syndrome is their favorite because uh, it's one of the few scientists you don't have to change his name to begin with the letter K because it already does. Okay, a little bit of docking going on here. Just try and get this thing lined up. One space station one. 11.7, 11.1. And 10 meters. This is looking good. And this, of course, this uh, capsule will return. It's not going to carry much with it, but will return once we have, you know, verified their ability to hang out in space and not, you know, fight over who gets the snacks and things like that. It's very important for astronauts to be able to understand the correct snack protocol, isn't it? 
You don't want to be stuck with someone that doesn't understand whose turn it is to get the, the new chocolate nibbles. Well, we have successfully attained a 131 kilometer orbit. Everything is nominal, uh, except the waste heat, which seems to be coming up at 0 0.01 per second, which means about two and a half days before this thing starts shutting things down due to overheating. I guess I could shut down one of these panels, and that might give me four, five days, maybe. That's great. We'll figure out what happens. I think I need to actually include one of those uh, radial heat exchangers. But never mind. Let us bring the new crew over. He's going to come over and check out the new digs. Apparently it has space for four. And it has special partitions around for not only trash, but rubbish and junk and refuse all in the same place. How can you not love something so luxurious? Look at that. It's all docked up. Let's take a look at the interior. There, look. See what I tell you? We got it all. Food, not food, laundry, refuse, trash, etc., etc. And a nice little view of the clouds below and the planet Kerbin. Wow, I bet he can't wait for his friends to join him. And they will no doubt join them because they're just like across that little space there. Yeah, let's, uh, you know, I'm going to shut down this engine in case I accidentally fire it since I have been known to do that in the past. And, uh,. Yeah, we get some other get some satellite antennas up. We want to make sure we're communicating. We deployed the magnetic uh, sensor thingy. That'll be uh, all sorts of fascinating, I'm sure. I'm not sure we actually are collecting data, but nevertheless, we uh, want to make sure we have it there. Okay, and we are communicating through Comsat One. I could probably switch my. Well, I don't have anything directional, but hopefully. When I move below the horizon, it'll automatically switch to the next one. That's the plan with the Communitron 32s. There we go. Okay, come on. It's your turn. Get inside and tell him what he's, how he's feeling. So it looks like the, the new version of Kerbal Space Program is going to have like a, a science lab part, which looks a lot like a stretched crew tank. And you're going to need to like... If you want to transmit things like the goo and the uh, the surface samples back, what you'll really need to do is take them to the lab and get them analyzed to actually extract the science from them. Okay, final German heading across the gap. There is nobody left in that ship there, which actually might be a problem because I wonder if I'll be able to control them. Ah, who cares? Just get in there and we'll figure about that when we got to it. Okay. Beautiful. Look at that. One big happy family. Oh, and he is quite happy. He's no doubt happy that he's sitting next to the science and the toothbrushes and the board games. He has a huge appreciation for spaceflight because he has all his favorite stuff. See, him there, he's sitting next to the rubbish and the junk. He's not so happy, huh? But he does have a beautiful view of the edge of the planet Kerbin. Wow, that really, really makes everything all worth it. A rather beautiful, uh, beautiful image of the edge of the planet and the tiny th skin of atmosphere in which they live, which is way thicker than it would be on Earth. But if it were, that's what we'd be seeing. And uh, this is the spacecraft on the night side with the, the new lighting. We have red and green lighting, the idea being, of course, that when you come into dock, you'll be able to see how you're docking and where you need to dock, and you'll just look at the color to uh, tell you. Uh, either that, or it just makes the thing look cool. I kind of like the looking cool attitude as well. Anyway, moving on. So we have a pilot. We have this rover. This is uh, still collecting science, and I figure since I have a week before, I'm I'm gonna let myself launch anything, or at least I have a few days. I'm not gonna rush at it because we want to make sure that. Uh, I just kind of don't like the ideas of being able to launch rockets one after the other. And there is a plugin, which uh, I, can't, I can't remember who it was, that uh, released a plugin which works along these lines, that if you uh, construct something, then it'll figure out how long it takes and then you know charge you the presumable, the, the same amount of time on the, um, on the global clock before you can actually launch. Anyway, our little pioneering rover is not launching, it is roving. It is rolling along the surface, 
trying to stay as close to the surface as possible because if it does get airborne, it is not going to have too much control. It would be rather unfortunate if it were to perhaps, well, you know, fly off a mountain and lose control. Oh dear, ah, no, what am I doing? Well, what I'm doing is I'm flying with my epic RCS system. Look at that. This rover, it doesn't just rove, it actually flies, huh? See, I was able to correct the, for that by burning, well, about one-eighth of my fuel. But nevertheless, that was quite a good little maneuver. Well, uh, you see, this thing has tricks left up its sleeve. Hopefully this rock doesn't have a trick, because we're going to pass through it. Oh, excellent. No, we're not going to pass through it. Okay. The goose seems to have gotten all sorts of boring. Okay. We have a lot to do here. We have a lot of... We have a long way to go. We're trying to get up to the high... Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, hold... No, no, get straight. Slow down. Oh, no! No, no, we've lost ourselves. Oh, wait, and we knocked one of those off. That is not what I wanted to have happen. And, ah, yes, merely moments after I demonstrated my ability to correct for that particular bounce, I uh, end up piling into the ground like a moron. Uh, not even like a moron, I clearly am a moron. I am somebody who uh, just clearly can't drive particularly well. But let's get this up. Yes, with the help of the RCS system, at least we can get it back on its wheels and continue on. Although I suspect that with only one panel powering everything, we're going to run out of uh, power if we're perhaps on the, the slopes. And indeed, in this post-production sequence, you can actually see at four times normal speed, my uh, electric charge is slowly decaying as I am going uphill. So I need to pause every now and then so I can actually do things like a uh, science. Even down to one solar panel, this thing is going to be quite capable of continuing our exploits on the surface of the moon and perhaps getting us a little more science that we can put towards newer and shinier toys. But of course, that will be in future episodes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.